Okay, guys, we have people still. Okay, Demont signing in. We have people still signing in. Uh, guys, welcome to the God Standard Forty Two. Um, I'm going to go ahead and put your notes here, and uh, there you go. So your notes are available online. Um, we actually, um, Jen, Jen had a problem, and God bless her because she makes the flyers every single um, every single week. Good morning, Demont. She makes the flyers every single week, and um, uh, you know had had problems with the spelling and I said well if you have you know if you can't change it I said I was going to call it untouchable so you know that's that's the premise of what we're talking about this morning and we have to focus on the place that we choose to rest in because it will affect whether we walked in victory or whether we walk in failure you know in in last week I was talking about do you want to get well and you'll see through the coming the the, the last um you know, uh, probably a couple months, I've been talking about access, you know, because of COVID, because of what, what society is going through, you know, I know that, that it sucks. I'll, I'll tell you right now, my mom is in the hospital right now. She was struggling a couple of days ago. Um, so, so a lot of this stuff has impacted us. Uh, you know, it, it's actually impacted the, the either us or, or lives that were very close to us. So, um, but the good thing is we have covenant and the good thing is, um, through what we've been able to do here at Life Change Church, that a lot of people that have been dependent on jobs for God knows how long uh, have now been able to, you know, in the midst of, of this economy, start their own businesses. Why? Because, you know, because of unemployment, they're like, well, maybe I can do something myself. And you have to understand you have leaders that run their own businesses and you have more tools and access to more tools than, than you know of all you need to do is access them. So that's been the theme is being able to access the resources that the kingdom of God has for you. And, and so anyways, so, so I'm going to go ahead and move on. The, the underlying theme that, that I started, you know, obviously at the beginning of the year, we were talking about the reformation of church. Reformation of church is in Isaiah 60 uh, through 62. Um, you know, and I'd been talking about that, but also one of the one of the main themes that I've been going back to is Genesis 1 and 28. And, you know, in, and it did change a little because it says to be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth. And it's talking about the spirit of God. And then it says, and subdue it. But we not only subdue principalities, powers, uh, rulers, and authority of dark places. Um, we not only subdue them, but we also restore the people around us. So when that commission was given, it was given before the fall of man. Our commission is actually found in, 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 um, uh, Isaiah 61 and four, and it talks about the broken being the ones that rebuild, right? And if I'm going to talk about that, you know, I had a couple people talk, you know, send me messages this week, you know, Greg, what about the tribulation, all this other stuff? And I said, man, I said, go to Acts. Um, I believe it's in three and 20. It says, all of heaven is restraining Jesus until the restoration of all things. Well, what do you mean? Well, everybody says doom and gloom. And I said, well, you know, right now is the reformation of the church, but it says that Jesus won't come back until the restoration of all things. Well, who restores all things? We do. So everything that's happening right now is on our watch. Go back to Isaiah 61 and four, look at your job, you know, go back to the great commission, right? And, and, and see what it is that we are supposed to do. Why would he say in Psalms two and eight for us to ask for the nations, right? And, you know, and, and so God has a plan. So let's go ahead and get into this. I'm going to continue back in the place that uh, we left off in Ephesians 1, 18 and 1, 19. I talked about this last week in God's standard. Uh, I, I talked about last week uh, flowing, you know, in the things of God. And then I demonstrated the prophetic, right? And then you guys uh, went in and did some journaling. And if you're in the God, uh, if you're in a breakthrough, make sure that, you know, uh, tomorrow, Bring at least one journal that you have. And if not, I'm not going to push you into something that you don't want to do. I can see the do not disturb sign on some people's chest. And that's fine. But be willing to come forth because this is a time where you're going to be able to take some risks. This is a time where you're going to be uncomfortable. And this is a time where, you know, you're going to stretch, right? So Ephesians 1.18 and 119, Paul prays that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he's called you. And what he's talking about is the invitation, right? The riches uh, of his glorious inheritance. What is riches in the kingdom? It's wisdom. So the riches of his glory inheritance uh, and the inheritance is what you have access to, is, is what you're being trained up into, right? Uh, for us who believe. 
Uh, and, and so it says then that power is the same, oh, excuse me, um, in his holy people and the incomparably great power uh, for us who believe that power is the same as the mighty strength. So we have to understand in this verse, he's saying, I pray that the eyes of your heart and heart be enlightened. A light, uh, enlightened actually comes, well, actually the word photosynthesis comes from that. And so it's talking uh, about a process from converting light energy to chemical energy to to um, uh, to fuel the organism's activity. So pray, Paul is praying that the light of the word of God would fuel us by converting light into revelation as revelation is what moves us. It's not just knowing 50,000 scriptures. It's having an understanding. It's how it's how when I was talking about last week that when we hear from God, the voice of God is spontaneous. It's a spontaneous thought. It's a spontaneous picture. It's a spontaneous emotion. So there's spontaneity, but we have to access the heart and flow of God. And through the heart and flow of God, we hear the voice of God, which is spontaneous thoughts, pictures, and emotions. How do I hear the, the voice of God? I was driving yesterday, just driving down the street, and all of a sudden, a spontaneous thought hit. Now, if you were in breakthrough, what I said last week, for me, it's like, it's like being T-boned. It's like my mind is going down one direction and all of a sudden something comes in and hits me from the side. And it's usually a vocabulary that I don't use. That's how I know it's from God. And it's always going to be something that lines up with the word of God, but it's something that I was not thinking about. So I'm not in my own intellect when I hear the voice of God for my life. Where am I at? I'm in a place where I may be talk, thinking about business or whatever, but all of a sudden, bam, something spontaneous hits me. And last week, like I said, if you were in breakthrough, I gave about five or six prophetic words. And I said, every word started with a picture. Now, I know Deanna's online. Deanna, I'm not going to tell your business. But Deanna, when I saw Deanna, I talked about God, God gave me the word warrior princess. And I'm like, God, this is kind of kooky, you know, warrior princess, really? And you have to remember the prophetic doesn't come in my language, it comes in hers. Think about this. When you release a prophetic word, and I'm actually off script, but when you release a prophetic word, God usually doesn't speak to it in my language, he speaks to it in hers. So what did warrior princess mean to me? Absolutely nothing. What did it mean to her? It meant something, right? So she texts me later, she goes, I always imagine myself as Xena, the warrior princess right? It's not, not a big deal. But Zena, the warrior princess, what did that mean? It meant something to her. So as soon as I gave that word that I knew nothing about warrior princess, I wasn't even going to put it on my paper, but God kept saying, I need you to write it. I'm like, God, this is kooky. I'm not going to do it. He goes, put it in there. So I'm like, okay, God. So I put it in there. What did it mean? It meant something to her. It meant nothing to me. The prophetic sometimes means everything to somebody else and nothing to me, but I have to release what God is saying, right? But again, the voice of God, spontaneous thoughts, pictures, emotions, like the burning bush. When things hit and they're out of an ordinary, I always give it attention. When I give it attention, that's when God opens it up and he enlightens my heart and it actually grows and I could start seeing the flow of what God's doing, right? So we have to understand Paul is praying that your heart is enlightened, that the capacity of the word of God that was planted in you would expand. Why? Because it ex also expands your ability to hear the voice of God for your life. So we have to understand that when, when we see light, revelation doesn't just make us reflect light, it makes us become light because we become, that word becomes now a part of us. Revelation makes you a part of the word of God. So you can't help it. When you start walking in revelation, you're walking as light and you have to understand it. And you walk as light, what happens? Darkness has to flee, right? So the Bible says in Isaiah 61 and 2, it says, arise and shine for your light has come. It's not that you're trying to be something. It's who you already are because you opened your heart to the word of God, right? And it says, and the glory of the Lord will rise upon you. Why? Because then it says, we're going to be in a time such as now where it says that darkness covers the earth and it says deep darkness, the peoples. What does that mean? They don't have the light in them. But what does it say in Romans uh, I think it's 8, 19 through 21. It says that there is a frustrated generation, that they are bound by destruction and decay, and they want to be brought into the children of light or, or under the, you know, with the, the, the glory of the children of God. But what are they waiting on? What does that scripture say? 
It's saying they don't even know it, but they're actually waiting on you to get a revelation of who you are. So when you realize who you are, you can shine in their light and it'll impact them and they'll want to be a part of what you're doing. There's a lot of people when you start moving in the things of God that become haters because now you're achieving success in a realm that they failed and misery loves company. They don't want you going up there. They want you down here. And oftentimes the people closest to you, when you start excelling, they come at you to pull you back down, right? And, and so we have to, again, maintain a relationship with God, maintain a relationship with our coaches, because you need validation somewhere to know that what you're doing is the right thing, right? So eventually you can come back, they're going to have to humble themselves, and you can pull them into the place that you're standing. So God's not just putting light in us, but he's putting revelation in us. So it'd be a part of us, and we would be co-revealers of truth. And we have to remember that signs and wonders follow believers. Why? To show everybody that what we're saying and what we're doing uh, is from God, right? Power has to, to show up in a believer's life to show that what we're doing is of God. And God doesn't give power to children. He gives power to sons and daughters, right? I'm not going to give Eli the keys to my Jeep, but when he becomes of age, I'm going to release some things in his life that he will be ready for, right? Now he's got a vision of him driving this awesome Jeep, but I'm not going to give him the keys. One day I will, but he's not ready for it right now. So let's go back. Ephesians 1, 18 and 19. It says, I pray that the eyes of your heart be enlightened so you will know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe? So Paul prayed that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened. Why? So you'd understand what God's calling you into and he's inviting you into that you would also understand the inheritance that he has for you. And you would also understand the power that he's made available for you, not just to receive it, but to release it. So he's saying, I'm praying that your heart understands what God's called you to, the inheritance that he's made available for you, and the power that he desires to release in your life to get your inheritance and also release, release it in the lives of others, right? So we have to understand that we have an adversary, generational, you know, um, I'll call them generational curses, but generational curses are simply there to stop the flow of the inheritance coming into your life. All they are is a blockage in the plumbing for your life, right? But you have to understand where they come from, right? And I'm going to show you today how you can easily defeat any adversary that comes against you, easily, right? And it has to do with the place that you decide to have rest in, okay? So I'm going to challenge your place of rest today, and, and you got to work with me. So Ephesians 6 and 12 says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. So let's go back to rulers, because that's the first thing they mentioned. Rulers is arch in the Greek, and it means origins and elementary teachings. Now, remember that I said, I think it was last week or the week before last, I said the right of uh, the first right. Uh, the law of first mention, and Chris mentioned it uh, in his book in Spiritual Intelligence, but it's true. The law of first mention states that when your child, when the truth is first revealed, well, not let's just say facts are, are first revealed in your life, whether it's true or not, that establishes your belief system. Now, it could work for good, but it could also work for evil. How does it work for evil? I could have trauma that comes in my life at a very early age that affects all of my relationships, right? And I released a word, you know, a few months back where God gave me a word that, that, you know, women, when they go through puberty, they deal with a rejection issue. But if you have love at home, then guess what? It seals the wound. If you get rejected at work or in school, and then you come home for the healing and you get rejected again, then that's when the wound stays open because it was never completely healed. So we have to understand that if we have a belief system that was established at a very early age, it's through that belief system or it's through that heart that creates a lens that we decide to see everything through. That's when I brought up the, you know, well, well, well God is a loving father. Well, not my father. My father abused me. My father raped me. My father did this, that, and the other thing, right? So it forces us just because of that law to see everything through that perspective. And that's where I talked about the uh, renewal of the mind in Romans 12 and 2. That's why I also brought up Romans 
you know, 828 is because when we pray in the spirit, we're praying with the Holy Spirit with Jesus and our will is bending towards his, right? So let's go ahead and go on. So we have to understand rulers means origin. It means the beginning, right? Now we have to also understand when it's talking about demons that evil spirits, they're named by, by the influence that they have on humanity. If I say spirit of anger, what is it doing? It's making people angry right? If I say deaf and mute spirit, what is it doing? It's making someone deaf and mute, right? If I say, you know, blind spirit, if I say adultering spirit, what is that, per what is that spirit doing? It's causing that person to get involved in infidelity, you know, perverse spirit, spirit of lust, what is it doing? It's causing that person to do the same thing, probably like at porn or whatever, but what is it doing? It's changing the nature of the person's origin. Why? because now it's changing the way that you see everything, right? And we're supposed to see everything through insight, right? Through inner light. So we have to understand that there are principalities, powers, you know, rulers and authorities of this dark world that are trying to come against us, that are trying to stop the call on our lives, that are trying to stop our inheritance and are trying to stop the grace and power that God is making available to us. So we have to understand our positioning, right? And this is big for you. And I want you to think about this. We are in what's called the first heaven. The first heaven is a terrestrial realm, right? Everything around us, the space, the atmosphere around us, it's the first heaven. The demonic that it's talking about, it says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Well, where are the demonic dwelling? The demonic dwell in the sec second heaven. That's where they launch their attack here into the first heaven. So you're saying, I'm here in the natural. I'm in the first heaven without Jesus. Yes, you have no access to anything else. Now watch this. This is what started this whole thing. I'm driving this week, and, and God's, God speaks this to me. He says, Greg, he said, do witches have power? I said, yeah, I guess they do. Think about this thought. I said, yes, they do. He goes, why do they have power? I said, they're operating from the second heaven. And he said, so they have power over people in the first heaven. I said, yes, they do. Watch this. Does sin have power over people? Yeah, it does. All those sins I mentioned. Why? Because it's birthed from the second heaven. So let me ask you this, and I put this in the, in the text, you know, Albert Einstein said, you cannot create, create a, a solution with the same mindset you used to create the problem. So if I'm looking at natural things through the first heaven lens, how do I overcome everything on the second heaven? You can't. You don't have the dominion and authority. So now watch this. So when someone calls me and says, Greg, I'm, I'm dealing with a panic attack, then I have to ask them, where are you seated? Are you seated in the first heaven? Are you seated in the second heaven? Are you seated in the third heaven? Where are you seated? And how does the enemy have authority in your life to bring an attack on your life? Well, he does if he can keep you in the first heaven, or if he sees that you're already sitting in the first heaven, then he can bring circumstance in your life that will overcome you in that realm. Oh, so you mean a lot of negativity comes in your life and it's an attack into the first heaven? Yeah, because he can't bring it against the third heaven. If he does, he's going to lose. Why? Because of your positioning. So where you find rest matters. Where you take a seat matters. And the enemy has that right based on his positioning in a second heaven. So when we, when we abandon the promise, when we abandon the grace of God for our lives, when we abandon what what leaders have told us in life, what does it do? It keeps you in the first heaven. So you mean that prevents me from doing what God has called me to be and, and, and do? Absolutely. Why? Because you're operating on a first heaven revelation, right? And the enemy has the ability, because that's your choice, Some sometimes it's indirectly, but if that's your choice, then the enemy can come from the second heaven every single time and his goal is to keep you in that first heaven. What's God's goal? To get you in grace, to get you seated with Jesus in heavenly places, right? So I'm going to talk about this a little bit further. So we have an attack that's on our origin. And what does that attack say? Well, first off, in, in the garden, Satan goes to, to Eve and says, did God really say? So the first thing, the first attack that came on in humanity was, what did God say? Right? And the second attack came on Jesus when he was in the wilderness. He said, if you are the son of God, the attacks have not changed. It's always going to be on what did God say and who are you? 
who are you always is, is the attack that's always going to challenge your origin, right? So the question is, who are you, right? If you identify more with your family than you do as a child of God, first heaven. I have another question. You know, do you believe in evolution or creation, right? Because when I got saved, my family, my mom, I said, what do you believe? She goes, well, I believe, you know, reincarnation. I said, well, then Jesus made a mistake going to the cross. Well, I've always kind of believed in that. Well, where's the truth found? You know, have you read the Bible? Well, kind of not really. Okay, so, so that's what drove me to the word of God because everybody had an idea but I went to the word of God, not knowing any better, but I figured, hey, this thing's been around for a while. I may want to tap into this. And that's when the spirit of God started revealing truth in my life. So now let's let's talk about current events. Am I a boy or a girl? Why? Origin. Now, if I answer that question correctly or incorrectly, do I marry a man or a woman? What is that doing? It's changing my origin. Why? Because now there's an argument that's saying, I was made this way. I wasn't created, but this is how I came out. Interesting. So what is it doing? It's trying to take you away from history, right? It's trying to take the testimony of the people that walk before you out of your lives. Why? Because as I said last week, there's power in a testimony, right? It says uh, in, in Psalms 19 and 2, it says, how blessed are those who observe his testimonies. So the blessing comes through testimony. Why? Because testimonies are prophetic for your life. It changes current situations and it changes future situations. So what is it doing? It's trying to separate you from a testimony, right? So I put on here all of these questions about origin. Um, they affect your calling. They affect your inheritance. They affect the power made available for you and your ability to accomplish it. It prevents you from accessing the very purpose for and for the very reason that you were created. So the enemy will always attempt to, to wipe out your origin by rewriting your history to pro prohibit access to your testimony. And that's what the enemy is trying to do. When these guys are going back, you know, I know some of it. Yeah, you know, you know, they're trying to change certain things. But man, when you try and change our history with God, you know, in America, when you try and and, and wipe out our relationship with Israel. God says, I'll bless them who bless you and curse those who curse you. There are real spiritual ramifications to that, right? So we have a, a, a history and we have a culture and we have access to testimonies of men and women of God who did great things before us. But the enemy is trying to shift all that and he's trying to change it. Why? So they can ask a question as to who are you? Why? Because your inheritance is dependent on the people that came before you. Why? If you know what they did before you, you know what you have access to. If they wipe out the testimony of the people that came before you, you don't know what you have access to. In the beginning of the call, I said last night when I was going to bed that I had my phone on my chest, I had my headset in, I was listening to a prophet prophesy person after person. What was I doing? I was just getting into the flow of the word of God coming out of a man of God, right? To stay grounded in that flow, to keep my heart enlightened to the things of God. So what happens when we start trying to answer these questions outside of God? It keeps people in darkness. It keeps them hopeless. It keeps them frustrated. And they live in a place from bondage to decay, which is in Romans 8, 21. So we have to understand our place in order for us to answer anything. In Ephesians 1, and I put a couple verses together so you see the flow. Um, it's actually Ephesians 1, and 1, You'll see in your notes, I slipped in Ephesians 2 and 6 in the middle of and I made this statement. It says, God raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the, uh, in the heavenly places. Then I put in two and six, and, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. And then it continues on. Far above, think about this, where did God seat you? Far above all rule, far above all authority, not just a little bit, far above far above all power, far above all dominion, far above every name uh, that is named. You mean the name of cancer? Yeah. You mean the name of poverty? Yeah. You mean the name of hardship? He put me above that. Yeah. But if you stay in the first level of heaven, you're still subject to it. So God has given me grace through Jesus Christ to be able to be seated with him far above all these things. Absolutely. Watch this. Not only in this age, but in the age to come. And he put all things, okay, all things. What are all things? 
He put all things in subjection under his feet. So you mean the second heaven is underneath me? Yeah, because now we're talking third heaven reality. So he's saying that whole realm is underneath you? Absolutely. And he gave him his head over all things to who? The church. So he gave him to the church, which is the body of Jesus, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So the fullness of Jesus, the fivefold ministry, is in his church. Absolutely. And what does it say? What did I say in the beginning? Genesis 1.20, fill the earth, subdue it, and restore it. It says, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Ephesians 4 said, he, uh, he descended and he ascended that he may fill all things. And it's talking not just people, all of creation, because it was all of creation that fell. The sin of man affected everything. So it's that the spirit of God would fill all things and bring restoration to them. So we have to understand if our origin is under attack, we have to understand where that attack is coming from and where are you resting when it hits your life? Are you resting in a first heaven reality? Are you resting in a natural situation? I went over to a friend's house yesterday and he's like, do you believe blah, 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 what they're doing to me? And, and I'm just kind of like chilling. And I'm like, so do you think all this is happening for a reason? And he kind of looked at me, he said, what are you talking about? I said, listen, I said, I understand you're upset, but let's, let's analyze this. You know, we have a heritage in Isaiah 54 and 7. It's our inheritance that there isn't any weapon that can be formed against us and prosper. It's our heritage. Okay, so what are you complaining about? Oh, you're complaining because you're on a first heaven reality. Oh, I'm, I'm coming at you. I walked in this house from the third heaven because grace is made available by faith in the third heaven. And my access to it is, is by faith and his grace, right? So I come in at the him and I'm watching him freaking out. And I'm like, why are you freaking out? I said, everything in your life is going to work out, right? I said, are you for God? He goes, absolutely. Then why are you freaking out right now? Oh, because you haven't renewed your mind. Because now you have a second level demon that is messing with your head and your faith is on the first level. I said, oh, you got to take the elevator up to two floors. I said, you'll be right where you need to be. And I said, allow the peace of God to work this thing out of your life. I said, quit freaking out. So we have access to a higher realm. Why? Because I'm seated with Jesus. And the view looks pretty good up here. I, I backed through my garage door this week. And you know what? My chest, I was like, that was $1,300 that just threw out the window. And every bad thing thought and every bit of negativity just rushed through, uh, you know, my head. And I was kind of bummed out for a little bit, but then I renewed my mind. I'm like, God can bring me money, he brings me money all the time. Why the heck am I freaking out? And then I'm like, then I'm beating myself up over it. Cause my garage door goes up and I look and I see it's going up. I don't even look back the second time. Apparently something triggered and it went back down and boom, you know, obviously Jeep garage door, you know, Jeep just plowed right through it. $1,300. And I wasn't happy about it. But I chose not to allow that thing to really tear me down. I immediately elevated. And man, every electrician, not every electrician, the garage store specialist came out. They said, we still don't know how that thing went back down. And I'm sitting there thinking, second heaven attack. I said, it was demonic. Because there's no way, he said, it can go back down. He goes, if anything trips it, it goes back up. It's the nature of a garage, garage door. Why did it go back down when I saw it going up? I don't know. But I'm not going to sit there and say that there's a demon under every bush. But at the same time, I'm going to look at that and I'm like, oh, sevenfold, I caught you, right? But I had to move on because I had other things to be focused on. I couldn't stay in a first heaven reality worrying about all the, where's the money coming and all this other stuff. No, I had to get my mind off of that and know where it is I'm going and put that thing behind me, write the check and keep rolling, right? But we can't stay grounded in our problem. We can't. We can't afford it. So we have to understand that, that, again, when we're under attack, we have to acknowledge where is it coming from, where are you resting, and what are you going to do about it? So remember this. Romans 5 and 20 says, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. And then it says in Isaiah 59 and 19, it says, when the enemy comes in, I changed the comma because it was incorrect. It says, when the enemy comes in, like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. So when the enemy comes in and decides from the second heaven to attack me because I'm carnal minded, God says, I'm going to raise up a standard against him and I'm going to overcome him. 
only if I'm partnered with God in his promise, right? So I have to understand where am I sitting? Where am I finding rest in? And what is the reality that's going on in my life, right? Because I can look at the people that are on the call and I could see on, on a few of you that there's a second heaven attack on your life. And some of you, not to condemn you, are still sitting here in a first heaven reality, you know, still wondering how the heck do I get out of this thing? Well, if you don't know how to get out of it, Listen to the men and God, women of God that are speaking into your life because maybe they see something that you don't see, right? And get close to those people so you can, you can glean off of the presence of God and the giftings on their life. Now watch this. I covered this last week. I said, when you honor a prophet or a righteous man, what does it say? You reap their reward. It's talking about the nature of the inheritance. When you don't honor them and you don't listen to them, what do you get? You don't get the reward, right? Honor those people. That's why I honor my pastor so much because the opportunities he's given me and Pastor Lynn Felice, no one's ever given those opportunities to me and Kristen. I'm thankful for it, right? Because they've allowed us to just move and flow in our gifting, which gives me, the Bible says it's a tree of life. You know, Proverbs 13 and 12. It's a place of fulfillment for our lives. It's just awesome. So anyways, so we have to honor those people. When you're not hearing God, hang out with people who are. Why? Because those people are hanging out in a third heaven reality. It's going to get even better than this. So watch this. So evil, and you better hear me, evil only has rest when it's seated in darkness. Think about this. This was the one thought that allowed me to put this whole thing together is evil only has rest when it's seated in darkness. So watch this. So you're a spirit with a soul and you live in a physical body, right? And I talked about it, you know, months ago, a stronghold, it's an ingrained repetitive thought process, which your mind regularly travels down. It's a coping mechanism. Second Corinthians 10, three, three through six talks about how to take care of it, but it's a dominating thought pattern that rules how you think, how you respond, and it determines your behavior. So maybe I'm stuck in a first heaven because I've created a coping mechanism, or maybe there was some trauma that happened in my life that's not allowing me access to a third heaven, and it's allowing the enemy to dominate me and stay at this first heaven reality in certain areas of my life where I just don't have breakthrough. That's why we started getting into deliverance and inner healing. Why? Because there's certain areas in our hearts that oftentimes that we don't see that is preventing us access to the higher levels because the enemy is resisting us from a second heaven, keeping us in a first heaven. So we cannot receive the grace from a third heaven from our proper seat in rule and dominion with Jesus, right? So we have to understand, watch this. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I want you to think about this. It says in Matthew 12, 43 and 45, it says now when an unclean spirit comes out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest and it doesn't find it. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds it unoccupied, swept and put together. Then it goes and brings along with it seven other spirits, more wicked than itself. And they come in and, and live there. And the last condition of the person becomes worse than the first. That is the way it will be with this, this evil generation. Let me ask a question. Now. It says, now when an unclean spirit comes out of a person, how does an unclean spirit come out of a person? How does it come out? So I said in the, in, the, um, in the previous text, I said evil only has rest when it's seated in darkness. So it says now when it comes out, how does it come out? It has to be recognized. Oh, okay. So we have to recognize the attack that's on our life, right? And then once we recognize it and we expose it, then our faith from a third heaven reality through the wisdom of God can actually not only expose it, but it can get it out of our lives. But at some point we got to confess it, right? And we got to release the thing that was in our heart. Why? From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If that thing is occupying your heart, what is it doing? It has to be released through a confession. I'm going to get into this. So it has to be released through a confession, but there's got to be wisdom that points to the source of it, right? In order for us to confess it and forgive ourselves from receiving it. It's our forgiveness that actually closes that door. 
But we have to understand that when an unclean spirit came out, there was a confession that was made. It was either a confession through a man or woman of God that walked in the wisdom of God through a word of knowledge or, or a prophetic word, or it was the reality that we realized where that thing came from. Here's my question. Can a man or woman of God speak in your life and show you your wound? And can they show it to you by the spirit of God? Do you trust those people? Do you trust where God's planted where you can trust the voice of God through somebody else about your wound in order to get something out of your life so you can get back in alignment with your call, receive the inheritance that God has for you in the power that God has for you to use that inheritance to get it in the lives of the other people. Can you do that? Let's go on a little bit further. So I asked the question myself, why would the enemy come back? The enemy can only come back as if he sees you resting in a first heaven reality, if he sees you going back to natural circumstances. I cast a demon out of a, a, a kid probably a couple months ago. And I always, um, because I get a lot of phone calls and I know Pastor does, and I have Pastor Lynn Felice, I know Tawana, we get a lot of phone calls. And this is my method because I learned it from Pastor. My method is when somebody like that gets, it was an extreme deliverance. When they get delivered like that, and they're like, hey, I need to connect with you. Okay, cool. I connected with the person for about 30 days. And for 30 days, I told them, do this, this, this. Didn't want to do it. Then I, after 30 days, I'm like, they don't want to do it. So I, I can't do anything. So they come back. They went back to the first heaven. You guys were probably there at church. Comes back to the altar. Manifestation. Bam. Power of God hits. Gets them delivered again. You know, once he gets up. It's like, hey, I just want to connect with you. I'm like, okay, well, I, I've spent quite a bit of time with you. And so the first conversation I had with him, I said, I need you to do something. He said, what's that? I need you to move out of the house that you're in. And I need you to move down to Life Change House. And I need you to get with men of God. And I need to get you under mentorship. Well, why would you have me do that? Because right now, the atmosphere that you're staying in, that first heaven reality that you're staying in, is only going to allow the enemy to come back and to come back in and gain access to your life and continue to rule you and dominate you from a second heaven reality. I said, I need you to move. And I said, when you decide to make that move, I say, you call me. Well, it's been over 30 days. Hadn't called me. Why? Because he decided not to move. Why? Because he went back to a first heaven reality. Watch this. Galatians 3 and 1 it says, you foolish Galatians. This is Paul. And he's rebuking him. He said, who has bewitched you? It says, before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the spirit of the works uh, uh, by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? Watch this. After beginning by means of the spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Guys, can I, I, I've been in the same church for 24 years. I've seen so many people get taken out because they start the spiritual journey. They get promoted and all of a sudden a flesh attack comes in their life right? And something comes back in their life and pulls them back down to a first heaven reality. And what does it do? It allows them to be dominated. And like I said, it allows them not to be able to fulfill their calling, uh, their, their, to access their inheritance and the power to walk that thing out in their lives. It affects everything, right? And so again, we can't decide, well, you know, I got saved, you know, in the spirit and it was good, but now I'm back doing my old thing. It doesn't work that way. Why? Because it puts you under the dominion of the enemy, right? And so you look around and you realize there's certain areas in my life right now that are not succeeding. And I have to again ask you, where are you seated pertaining that situation, right? And if you realize where you're seated and where God's in the situation, then you'll realize why domination is happening in your life. Jude 1 and 6 says, and I remind you of the angels who did not stay within the limits of their authority that God gave them, but left the place where they belong. God has kept them securely chained in prisons of darkness, waiting for the great day of judgment. So they left their post and they left their authority and they left their dominion, right? Which entitled you to rule over all things, right? Proverbs 26 and two, it says, like a fluttering sparrow or a darting swallow, an undeserved curse will not land on its intended victim. A curse cannot land on a righteous person. So why are we still walking up to the altar that are under the curse? First heaven reality. We haven't renewed our mind, right? 
Luke 8, 17. Watch this. I said, for nothing is hidden that will, will not be made manifest, nor is anything secret that will not be known and come to light. And so I put in here, how do we get darkness out of our lives? Well, we have to go up to the third heaven by faith, grab the grace of God and bring it back down, right? So we have to go up and we have to get wisdom. We have to elevate. It says our kingdom come, our will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But we have to be able to access our heavenly resources, right? We have to be able to access it. And, and Paul talks about being able to access it through Ephesians 3, 8 and 10. He said, to me, the very least of all the saints, this grace, third heaven, was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ. What are the riches of Christ? It's wisdom. And to enlighten the hearts of all people as to what the plan, the calling, the inheritance, and power of the mystery, which is for ages, has been hidden in God, who created all things, so that the multifaceted wisdom of God, watch this, the multifaceted wisdom of God might now be made known through the church, where's the church? The fullness of Jesus. So the multi, the manifold wisdom of God, Joseph's jacket, many colors, the wisdom of God, the many layers in the depths of the wisdom of God, who's going to be made known through? Oh, the church. Who's the church? You are. So it's going to be made known to the uh, through the church, watch this, to the rulers. Rulers speaks of origin. Oh, so what is that doing? It's speaking about your beginning. It's resetting your truth lens in life. Why does it say come to the kingdom and receive it like a child? To reset your truth lens. So it's going to reset the origins and the authorities in the heavenly places. What's it going to do? It's going to be made known to the demonic because of who you are. So your wisdom, it's going to allow you to overthrow the dominion of darkness. The wisdom will. Yeah, look at Zechariah 1, 18 and 19. It says four horns are going to be raised up. And it's talking about global powers are going to dominate here on earth. And then God says, I'm going to respond. I'm going to, I'm going to raise up a level of grace through raising up, it says, four craftsmen that says that will terrify them and will throw them down. But it's talking about our ability to go higher and to grab hold of the wisdom of God through faith so we can release his grace into the second heaven into the first heaven and bring people out of the dominion of darkness and into the glory of the kingdom of God, right? But we have to be able to have wisdom. So watch this. I asked on the last page, I said, Matthew 12, 43 and 45, how do I get this out of my life? It's very easy. It says, now when an unclean spirit comes out of a person, didn't I say confession is what gets it out of a person? So watch this. So a stronghold is an ingrained repetitive response mechanism, right? A lot of times, well, first off, it violates trust in God. So it's the very area of our wound that we won't submit to God. And because we refuse to submit it to God, we keep it as a stronghold and we hide it from God. And if we hide it from God, God's given us free will. So God does not have access to it. So the very principalities, powers, rulers, and authority of darkness, that second heaven reality is now ruling us because we've kept it. We've harbored it in our hearts, right? So we have darkness in our heart. Then I put on here that darkness only has power in darkness. Think about this. Evil or darkness only has power in darkness. From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Whatsoever is hidden shall be brought into light. So how do I get people free? How do I get them free? I need a word of knowledge. Or I need them to get a revelation of their wound. And what do I need to do? I need to have them confess it. Why? Because if I can get you to confess the thing that's harboring in your heart from a second heaven, if I get it to come out of your mouth through a confession, whatsoever had power in darkness no longer has power. Why? Because now I brought it in the light. When I bring it in the light, that thing no longer has power. How do I get people delivered and set free? I get them to, through a third heaven reality and a gifting in my life, I get a word of knowledge about their wound, or they get it themselves. We confess it. It only had power in darkness. Now when they confess it, it no longer has power. 
So I made it powerless through a confession. Watch this, James 5.16. James 5.16 says, therefore confess your sins to one another, your false steps, your offenses. Then it says, and pray for one another that you may be healed and restored. The heartfelt and persistent prayer of a righteous man, believer, can accomplish much when put into action and made effective. It is dynamic and, ha and can have tremendous power. So we have to realize what it is. So the wisdom comes from a third heaven reality. And I'm just doing this for a visual. A third heaven reality wisdom comes. So you from a first heaven can confess it and release it. And that thing that had in power and darkness, that stronghold is now out in the light. And the thing out in light no longer has power because it's in the light. So you just released it. And then you forgive for receiving it, right? You renounce that thing, you close the door, and now it's out. Why would it try and come back in? It says it's, it's, it's in arid places and waterless places trying to seek rest because it realizes it has no power out in the light. So it's trying to get back into your life through an old wound so it can hide back in darkness. It can have power once again. But if I keep an attitude of co confession and repentance in my life, whenever an issue comes up, every time I confess my own issue, I put it out in the light. And what does it do? It removes the power of it. And of course, I renounce it and I forgive myself for receiving it. And it closes that door and it constantly through this renewal process cleans out my heart and it keeps those things out there. And then I continually guard my heart and I don't let those things back in. But if I do let them back in, then I confess it because it had power in darkness and I release it. And it says before I even pray for any healing, because healing is going to come through the spirit of God, right? Healing comes through the spirit of God. So before I can even get there in that person's life, I have to understand, I have to confess it. I have to release it. I have to forgive myself, right? And then once I've gotten it out, then what happens? The spirit of God comes in and fills that place and it brings healing. So confession is the first step to get somebody made well, right? So we have to understand that we have to be able to understand with every situation in our life, where's your weakness, right? Where's your weakness? And if the enemy's attacking you right now, is he attacking you in a, in a place where you've chosen to rest in the first level? Have you allowed your storms and your circumstances to dictate who you are? Because if that's where you're resting and that's where your boat is, well, again, second heaven reality is going to continue to, to hammer on you. And you got to go to where you were seated. Jesus Christ, through his death on the cross, gave you access to be a co-laborer with him, to be seated with him in high places, to have access to the wisdom of God anytime you wanted to, to be able to respond. That's why when evil people come on my, my life and they say stupid things, I don't immediately respond. Why? Because I'm looking for the wisdom of God. Because a lot of times there are attacks in my life. Hey, Kristen, uh, dog's out. You might want to go get him. Um, there are attacks in my life where I cannot afford to respond to a second level attack with a first level word. It is not going to work. I need the wisdom that comes from God to be able to dominate that thing, to rule over that thing so I can win in life. Well, what was the purpose of this call? I need you to start evaluating areas in your life where you may feel like there's pressure, where you may feel like there's obstacles, where you may feel like I'm not where I'm supposed to be. And I need you to, number one, confess your fault and failure. Jesus, come to me who are weary and heavy laden. He says, I'm going to give you rest. But I need you to go to him and I need you to confess that place of weakness, right? And quit empowering it through second heaven. Quit empowering it and get the wisdom from God to change it. You have to understand that everything God wants in your life is for your good in his, right? It's for good. Whatever your heart wants, God wants it for you, right? But he's looked look down the quarters of time and the gifts in your life accelerate, right? First Corinthians 12 and 7, that, that, that the gifts are coming into your life because they're eternal. They move fast. So the quickest way you can get to the place God's called you is through the wisdom of God, right? And it will bypass that second heaven and, and there's going to be a little bit of fight. But, but God is going to get you there. But we have to understand 
that God has a way, you know, in our life to be able to prosper us, to give us hope in a future, but it has to be through a third level. In Ephesians 1, 18 and 19, it says, I pray that the eyes of your heart be enlightened so you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of, of his power towards us to believe. Enlighten your heart. Be honest with God. Give God your heart and go to him. Confess your weaknesses. Because when you do, you take the power of the enemy and you remove it from your life, right? And then go to him for a word. Go to him for wisdom. And if you don't have a coach in your life, everybody on this call should have somebody that they can call and say, hey, I need help in this place. If you, if, if you want to run a business, hey, you run a similar business. I need help. Oh, hey, uh, I have anxiety. Oh, you got delivered from anxiety. Hey, I'm in a dysfunctional relationship. Oh, you're in a healthy relationship. The Bible says it's the meek that inherit the earth. And meek means teachable people inherit everything. And God has an inheritance for you, but it's got to be through honor, right? So that's all I got for you guys this week. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and I'm going to pray you guys out. And tomorrow we are going to have a church at 11 o'clock. Uh, Pastor Lynn Felice, I don't know if you have anything um, in the form of announcements. Um, announcements wise, um, we are, let's see, pastors here. Hold on. Hello. Okay. Can you hear us? Greg? Yeah. Yeah. I can hear you. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> so we're just going to be doing Wednesday night, Facebook live. And then on Thursday, this Thursday coming up, we will not have Celebrate Recovery, but we will have Celebrate Recovery on the 31st, which is New Year. So we're having a New Year's get together on the 31st for CR. But the next two um, Wednesdays will be Facebook Live, and then we will be having regular church um, for, you know, at regular service. So those are the announcements. Also, um, tomorrow breakthrough. I always try and get it started a little bit earlier, try and get there about 9.30. Tomorrow we are, uh, let me see, tomorrow we're doing words of knowledge. We're actually activating you guys in the gift. And um, so I expect you guys to hear them all. And uh, so so it'll be a great time, but make sure you're there. Um, I did have a couple of texts of people that could not make it, just vacation, what have you. Um, understand what I'm doing is I'm recording it on Zoom. And because like last week, you know, we are in a safe environment. You know, when I when I gave prophetic words, we were we were recording it, but I don't want to put that out to YouTube, right? Just just for respect to people in the class. So it's it's an intimate setting. You know, if you're if you're in the class, I trust you. So what I do is I will send the Zoom link to you, but you got to get a hold of me. I'll send the Zoom link to you. I'll send you the notes so you can go through that yourself. I would like everybody there, but again, I do understand it's the holidays. And 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 also if you guys feel, if some of you feel that, hey. I'm just not getting everything that you're teaching because I am coming at you with the heavy and I am un and I am coming with the assumption. That's why I'm not preaching on faith and all this other stuff. I am under the assumption you're coming into this class with certain things. So I'm not covering them. I'm just kind of moving. And so um, you can come in in any class that I'm teaching and say, hey, I want to get, you know, hey, you're teaching words and all this week or you're teaching journaling with God you know, can I get in that class? I'm going to say, come on in, you know? So it just gives you access where you can come back to a class and say, Hey, I want to get back in that class. I have people that come back through first steps over and over and over again, because they just want to get it. You know what I mean? So it's not, we're not stuffy people and say, Hey, no, you can't come in, you know, but, but make sure that you are getting it. Make sure that, 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 um, uh, you are asking questions if you don't understand. And, and, you know, and, and I know this is moving fast, um, but you'll see the foundation, you know, where we started. Um, we, we, we started with getting filled with the Holy Spirit. We went right into journaling and hearing the voice of God. And now we're going to use that foundation to hearing the voice of God and accessing words of knowledge for other people's recovery, right? So, so tomorrow is going to be a good class. And uh, yeah, and, and that's it. So I'm going to go ahead and pray you guys out. Father, we come in the name of Jesus. I lift each and every believer up to you, Lord. Father, I thank you that they have a heritage of protection, Lord God. Lord, that they have a heritage of prosperity. Lord, that they have an inheritance that you've made available. Lord, you've called them 
and, and, and you've destined them for greatness. So you said in your word, Lord Jesus, that every day of their life was already numbered before one of them came to pass. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, I ask that you align our hearts, enlighten our hearts, Lord, that what you wrote about us, Lord, we would align with those words, Lord God, and that we would be moved by the Spirit of God to be able to fulfill it. So Father, bless each and every person. Protect them, Lord God. I know that I got some calls about COVID. I plead the blood of Jesus over them. I plead over their families. I plead over their stuff. Cover them, Lord God. And Lord, I thank you that your spirit of peace rests upon them, Lord, that there's, there's no worries. There's no anxiety. Lord, there is your righteousness, which has determined all will be well with every single listener on this call. So I thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys. I will. Thank you, Pastor. Amen. Thank you, Greg. All right, guys.